All right, welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Amanda Carling. For those of you who don't know, um, I am the manager of Indigenous Initiatives here at the Faculty of Law, which means among many, many other things, I have the great privilege of working with the Indigenous students here at the Faculty of Law, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful to see that some of them who are not here over the summer made time to be here. Um, and I'm really grateful that so many people came out today. I thought that having an event on Thursday afternoon in June, right before a long weekend, would mean that we might have a handful of people. And when I saw the numbers go, going up and up and up on the event rate, I couldn't believe it. So um, I think it's important. It's important um, just generally, but I think it's particularly important the day before people are going to start to celebrate Canada 150. Um, it's a very complicated thing for a lot of Indigenous people, uh, especially people like me who uh, are greatly privileged by some of the things that Canada have given me. Uh, but for a lot of Indigenous people, it's 150 years of oppression, 150 years of racism, of violence against our languages, our traditions, our peoples, and our communities. But it's also 150 years of resilience. And as uh, our professor uh, Douglas Anderson likes to say, the colonial project has failed. So for that reason, <laughs> uh, for that reason, I want to start by acknowledging the land, and that's what we're here to do today. Uh, this land on which the University of Toronto operates is sacred. It's been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. It's a whole lot more than 150 years. This land is the land of the Huron-Wendat, the Patoon First Nation, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably care for and share this land and the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this meeting place, Toronto, is still the home to many Indigenous people, some of whom we see in the room today, and I'm grateful for our guests making it out, including my friend's baby. <laughs> having a bottle issue right now. Um, and, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So this statement, which I just read to you, was developed in consultation with First Nations House, its elders circle, some of the scholars in the field, and senior university officials. And it's been developed for use on all three of University of Toronto's campuses, so you've probably heard it around. Um, and for that reason, it's important to say it, but it's also important to recognize that it just kind of starts to skim the surface in terms of what we need to know and think about when we're talking about the land that we're on. Um, and I'm really grateful that we have traditional teacher Lee Miracle, who's here today, who's going to speak about this place and this land that the law school uh, gets to be a guest on. Uh, but first, I'm going to invite Dean Edward Iacobucci to provide greetings on behalf of the Faculty of Law. Just in one second. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. This is the agenda. Um, and then I'm going to invite uh, the co-presidents of the Indigenous Law Students Association, uh, Joshua and Zachary, and they're going to talk a little bit about this project. And then I'm going to invite our wonderful artist, to Bell Redbird, to the stage, and he's going to unveil his painting. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from Lee Miracle. So I'm really excited about this event. As I was telling Helena earlier, I feel like I really nailed it. <laughs> I feel like this is going to be a really great afternoon. <laughs> um, and, but I do want to really strongly acknowledge the support of this institution, the Faculty of Law, the support of our dean uh, who, who helped this happen. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and the Jackman Humanities Institute, who are supporting this event. Uh, and most importantly, I want to thank Professor and Associate Dean Karen Knopp, uh, because she has been a huge uh, inspiration in getting this done. And I can't see her. I took my glasses off to read. Yeah, <laughs> she's there. Thank you so much, Karen, for all of your support in this. And yes. It's been wonderful. So now I'm going to invite Dina Yakbuchi to the stage. Thank you. When, when Amanda says, wait a second, you wait a second. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so welcome to the Faculty of Law and, and specifically to the, to the new, uh, which we'll keep saying for a while yet, uh, Jackman Law Building. I want to echo Amanda's uh, acknowledgement of the land on which we are located. Um, we are grateful uh, to have the opportunity to work and share this land. Um, last fall, we opened the building. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, and I'm sometimes reminded, uh, we haven't rushed into hanging things up on the walls. Um, earlier this year, uh, our students joked that the building looks like a beautiful modern art museum after the heist of the century, <laughs> which, I th which I thought was a pretty good line. Uh, even though it hurt a little bit. Um, <laughs> there are a few reasons uh, why we haven't rushed into hanging things on the wall. Im Im importantly, uh, we haven't uh, bought art because our fundraising efforts are largely directed at our enhancing our student financial aid program, and that's an important consideration. But it's also because what we hang, we want to be important. Uh, and this is our new home, and many of us uh, spend more time in this space than we do at our actual homes. Um, that's why I could not be more excited about the opportunity to hang this piece, a meeting place for all our relations in the new building. It will serve a reminder for all those who walk our halls that this space has been occupied by Indigenous people for thousands of years, and we're privileged to have the opportunity to be here. Um, this project is one of many being run out of the Indigenous Initiatives Office. Uh, the school has had uh, a history of the importance of, of paying attention to and appreciating the importance of Indigenous topics, but I think it's also fair to say that those, that recognition and those activities have been ramping up in recent years. So six years ago, we had the position, uh, the Aboriginal Law Program Coordinator, now the Manager of Indigenous Initiatives, uh, Amanda. That position was created six years ago. Um, that position not only serves to support the Indigenous students who are at the, at the faculty, but also, and with Amanda's uh, really inspired leadership, um, leads a variety of initiatives to make uh, both our Indigenous students feel at home, but also to educate uh, the sort of settler community about Indigenous issues. So uh, there have been a variety of things going on. Uh, there's, an there's a speaker series. Uh, there's opportunities uh, for our Indigenous students to pr participate in the national Kawiskamon moot, um, that which that moot, by the way, started at the University of Toronto. Um, there are other kinds of moments that are both social and, I think, uh, academic in, in nature that uh, Amanda has been responsible for. When the Truth and Reconciliation Report was recognized, it was clear that the law school had a responsibility uh, to account for the recommendations, but also the learning uh, that that commission uh, surfaced. Um, there was a committee uh, chaired by Professor Sanderson and co-chaired by Mayo Moran, who, with other colleagues, including Kent Roach, was directly involved in the uh, various aspects of the TRC, to advise the school on how best to respond to the calls to action. We've been doing a number of different things, um, but one of the important things I think that we've done is, on, on the advice of that committee, is uh, hired research assistants to help our faculty, many of whom will not be aware of various uh, Aboriginal legal issues or Indigenous legal issues, but to help them uh, provide research support for them to think about ways in which they can incorporate Indigenous issues into the classes that they are teaching. Uh, we've added basically mandatory lectures on history. This is something I know Professor Sanderson, I think, uh, n not only believes to be very important, but then demonstrates how important some greater appreciation of history is for people to understand both the legal context for in contemporary indigenous cases, Aboriginal law cases, uh, but also just to understand the cir circumstances in which indigenous peoples find themselves today. So that's a, that's a, those are a series of lectures, two, there's two lectures that he gave that are just master classes for the, for the first years, um, providing some history and some context, and then also showing directly how they relate to a couple of cases. Uh, there's, there's also sessions uh, in our professionalism and ethics training about the importance of indigenous issues. Uh, as I said earlier, Amanda's been terrific in initiating many of these things. Uh, that she uh, has convened, I don't know how many by now, but uh, of the blanket exercises, both for our community where I and many colleagues participated, um, both faculty and staff colleagues and hundreds of students, both from the law school and other divisions on campus have, have taken part in what I found to be both incredibly educational but also a very powerful, viscerally and powerful uh, experience. So there's a lot more that must be done, uh, not only can be done, but must be done um, 
there are, there's, uh, I think, lots of enthusiasm, not just within these halls, but elsewhere. Uh, we had a really wonderful meeting with Chief Stacy LaForme of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, thinking about ways in which the law school and the Mississaugas can partner more deeply. And I think the opportunities there are, are really uh, wonderful for us, uh, and I'm humbled by their openness to that kind of collaboration. So uh, there's a lot going on here. This piece by uh, J. Bell Redbird will be among, I think, one of the more visible uh, manifestations of our interests uh, in our First Nations, our indigenous peoples, uh, and we're so grateful for the gift that you are giving us. Um, I'm, I'm particularly delighted that the work was completed here at the law school. It just adds that much more significance to it. Um, so I look forward to seeing the finished piece. I saw some earlier, uh, it be, you know, a few brush strokes had already been applied, and it, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the finished piece and to hearing our teaching um, from Lee Maracle. But again, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Mr. Redbird. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for organizing. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I now get the honor of introducing two of my favorite students, and actually all of the students in this room are my favorites. <laughs> uh, but these are among the two who, uh, who are being bothered by me more this summer than the others. So, uh, Zach and Josh are the co-presidents of the Indigenous Law Students Association, and they're both going to be starting their second year here in September. Zach, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> both of you. Both of you. So <laughs> this is, Zach was born in Calgary and raised just west of the city in the town of Cochrane in the foothills of the Rockies. He's Plains Cree and also have, has ancestry from Scotland, Ireland, Belarus, and Russia. He came to the University of Toronto in 2012 to begin his honors bachelor degree majoring in public policy and governance and minoring in Aboriginal studies and the Russian language. Quite the combo. Just to keep things interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably the only person who ever had that combination of <laughs> degree. Uh, he graduated in 2016 with high distinction, uh, and we were very happy when he accepted the offer to come to the Faculty of Law here. This summer, he's working at Aboriginal Legal Services with Program Director Jonathan Rudin as a research assistant, and they're developing a legal practitioner's textbook regarding Indigenous people's experiences with the Canadian criminal justice system. And Josh is from Poundmaker Cree Nation in central Saskatchewan, as well as Calgary, Alberta. He studied philosophy and classical studies at UBC in Vancouver, and this summer he was awarded a Colwood Fellowship to work with the Royal Ontario Museum. He's researching treaties from both Indigenous and Western perspectives, and his research will be used by the ROM staff and teachers across the country to teach Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth about their treaty obligations, and more importantly, the real history of this country. I was away, yeah. Um, I was away the last couple of weeks on a very lovely holiday, and Josh was my man on the ground. So I was very, very grateful, and I'm very grateful to have his uh, to have his help, and so glad that both of them are here at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, and that I get to uh, be here. So I'm going to hand it over to them, and they're going to say a few words about the piece. Thank you so much, Amanda, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Amanda said, I'm Josh, and this is Zach. We're the co-presidents of the Indigenous Law Students Association. Uh, ILSA, for short, um, is a student-run group supported by the faculty that offers a, so a social and support network for Indigenous law students. We also advocate for the inclusion of Indigenous content and curriculum, uh, the programming and resources at the faculty, and we aim to raise awareness of Indigenous legal issues amongst the student body and the broader legal community. Uh, in coming up with this uh, vision, I guess, for the initiative here, uh, Ilsa had a brainstorming session and we uh, came up with a number of ideas which Zach has so eloquently, eloquently put into words and he's going to share that with you now. I, I don't know about eloquent, eloquently, let's we'll see how, <laughs> how that works. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Zach. Um, so for Ilsa, uh, this idea, this image uh, is very dear to us and it means a lot to us. In fact, I believe it's the reason that all of us came together at the school. Because this image of Toronto as a meeting place is a lifeway for finding 
right relations with all of our relations on this territory. What does this mean? It means multiple layers of uh, interactions uh, dealing with both historic relationships between all the peoples of this land. Uh, it also means uh, honoring those treaty relationships uh, between the peoples of this land. For indigenous peoples, uh, this means uh, honoring the dish with one spoon uh, on this territory in Toronto as a meeting place uh, by coming together uh, and sharing with each other so that we might grow and heal and become strong once again. And for non-Indigenous peoples, Toronto as a meeting place is also a way of engaging and embracing uh, the two row wampum, for instance, uh, coming together with, non -ind or with Indigenous people uh, in this place, in this space, uh, in peace, love, and respect. Now, it's more to us than just an image or just an object or just a painting. This idea is also a process. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, and a lot of choices on a daily basis. The painting itself is a brilliant example. Because though it's a physical object, it's so much more than that. It was a process of building a relationship between people at the law school and the artist, a process of sharing resources and sharing time and sharing space. And ultimately, it was a process of giving a platform for a very, very talented man to share what was in his heart and to create something beautiful to share with us and to share with future generations. And it's something that will guide us moving forward. So you see, it works out pretty well. <laughs> and we wanted to honor that and put that in the forefront uh, of how we, Ilsa, believe that the law school should and does operate. Now also, uh, we wanted to uh, bring this image forth to illustrate a choice or the power to choose that we now have. I mentioned before that this process requires a series of choices every day. We acknowledge that this moment, this event, comes at a very pivotal time in the history of both this law school, the new building, but also this country as a whole. Because for hundreds of years, institutions of law in Canada have almost single-mindedly pursued the destruction of these lifeways and the people who lived them. And much has been sacrificed to ensure that those lifeways survive. Uh, much, con uh, much continues to be sacrificed every day, including today up on Parliament Hill, if you've seen the news. And yet, we now also live in a time where institutions like the University of Toronto Faculty of Law are becoming beacons of hope. Hope that these lifeways and the people who live them will resurge so that we can sh uh, shine a light for all the people of this land once again. And we are entering a truly exciting time. But we are at the crossroads. There is a choice before us. We do have the freedom to choose how we uh, take our next steps. We can either choose to be a part of the colonial problem or the colonial project, which has failed, or we can choose to embrace, engage, celebrate, and nourish these life ways, coming together, sharing, building relationships, and moving forward. And I believe if we do that, then we can create truly beautiful things. So like I say, it's exciting times. <laughs> Before I give it back to my colleague Josh to introduce the artist, uh, I want to leave you all with a thought or a question, really, that I want you to think about uh, while you take in what our speakers have to say. Uh, and as you uh, experience the imagery. So I mentioned uh, we have a choice. And choices define who we are. 
And you have all chosen to come here today in the meeting place to share with each other and build relationships and to find that, those right relations. And my friends, this was a good choice. <laughs> um, the question I want to leave you with after you've chosen to come here today is what will you choose to do next? So thank you. It is now our pleasure to have a short introduction for Mr. J. Bell Redbird. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jay is a very talented artist from the Wukumakom First Nation, uh, very highly sought after. So I think we're quite lucky to have his artwork here on campus. Um, over the past few weeks, I've had the great pleasure of getting to know Jay. And not only is he a very welcoming and kind person, he's also a natural storyteller and a very gifted teacher. And I've really enjoyed uh, our conversations, and in particular, I really enjoyed the lessons he's uh, explained through this artwork. And through this artwork, I think the law school is going to be very much enriched uh, through the messages, the indigenous teachings in there, the indigenous laws in there. I think it's really a very powerful representation of indigenous identity within the faculty. And so uh, please join me in giving Mr. J. Bell Redbird a very warm welcome. Everybody, I'm Jay, and um, they said everything. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to say thank you to the uh, Dean Edward and Amanda and the crew. Thank you very much, and thanks for putting up with my jokes, Amanda. And um, but uh, this painting is uh, representing all the nations, putting the, um, the city there, the cityscape, the CN Tower, um, the animals, like um, the west represents the uh, raven on the top, uh, right? And then the eagle represents uh, the Ojibwe people, the, um, the messenger, and the bear is, um, for like in the middle of Canada, and it represents healing. And then the uh, wolf uh, represents uh, down like the Mohawk people. And then the big circle in the middle is the colors of the uh, Métis sash, the colors. And uh, the eagle is a messenger, and uh, you lay your uh, tobacco down to a cedar tree and you say your name. And uh, to, um, and then say a prayer to the Creator, and the eagle is always looking for those prayers so he could bring it up to the Creator because he could fly the highest. And then the raven represents, they take care of the uh, medicines. And um, the wolf is uh, the pathfinder that leads you to the safest, easiest, quickest way in your journey of life, of whatever you want to do. And the bear sits in the uh, the north doorway of the sweat lodge, and uh, that represents healing and good medicine. And then I have uh, the seven trees that represent the seven grandfather teachings, which is love, respect, honesty, truth, wisdom, bravery, and humility. And then I have the two big trees on the, on the sides that represent for the male and the female, the uh, elders. And then I have uh, four stars in there, to represent all four nations. And uh, my lines represent to follow that good life, walk that good life, and um, it never closes so you don't be hard on yourself. You could always come back and continue that beautiful walk on that line with uh, the seven teachings in there. I put all those seven dots to represent that. And then the other uh, lines in the um, paintings represent uh, not to judge other tribes or their languages. And I kind of switched it a little bit, not to judge other religions or their cultures, because times have changed. And then um, I have mind, body, and spirit in there for the lines. And the black outlines are the positive message of the teachings of the animals. And um, there's so much more in there. And uh, I just want to say it's been an honor to uh, paint here and to uh, 
be in a nice, wonderful studio space. <laughs> and then after when it was like quiet at about seven o'clock, then I could uh, turn my music up a little bit. <laughs> the, do a little bit of dancing. And thank you, Helena. And uh, yeah. Oh. And thanks to my dad over there. Thank you so much. Um, we have a little gift for Jay. Uh, we just want to keep him forever. So we got him a University of Toronto sweatshirt in a Faculty of Law bag with a Faculty of Law pen. <laughs> and we hope that you'll come back. Yes. Because we you. love having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, and now I have the privilege of introducing our last speaker of the day, last but certainly not least, uh, traditional teacher Lee Miracle. Lee is uh, Stolo from the Stolo Nation. She's a grandmother of four and a mother of four. It's a lucky number, eh? Yeah, it's changed now. It's changed, there's... <laughs> grandmother of seven. Okay. <laughs> hey, <laughs> another important number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, she was born in North Van, BC. Her works include the novels Raven Song, Bobby Lee, Sun Dogs, uh, and short story collection, The Sojourner's Truth, poetry collection, Bent Box, and the nonfiction work, I Am Woman. She's co-editor of My Home As I Remember and Telling It, Women and Language Across Cultures, editor of a number of poetry works, gatherings, journals, and has published in dozens of anthologies in Canada and America. America. I'm, ooh, it was a portmanteau. <laughs> Lee is an award-winning author and teacher. She's the mentor for Indigenous students here at the University of Toronto, and she's a teacher. She's a traditional culture director for Indigenous Theatre School, and she's a part-time cultural instructor, and she's many, many, many more things, and I feel really honoured and privileged to get to work with her, her as a staff member at the University of Toronto, and I'm really grateful that she made time for us today, so, merci. That was my book list for 1995. <laughs> I guess I haven't written anything since. <laughs> my last three, I'll just mention them. One is Celia's song. Uh, it's the journey through the story of the double-headed ser serpent, and I'm gonna talk about that because there's laws that go with our stories. Can you take that out, young man? And, uh, <laughs> it's probably in mine. It's probably my daughter trying to find me. You know how to answer it? <laughs> 0909, no, this guy. <laughs> Hello, this man. <laughs> 0909 is the password. <laughs> Don't pay attention to that. <laughs> I hate all these passwords. <laughs> I was thinking of just getting a Facebook page and listing all my passwords. <laughs> Not putting the names of the, you know, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so, I was uh, with my elders uh, in Vancouver, which is such an honor because I'm old. Uh, we don't live very long. And so, a lot of us don't have people in their 90s hanging around still, but I happen to have two in the Stalo Nation that are 90 and uh, did not go to residential school. And so their knowledge is very pure and their language is too. And I have to say, <laughs> I found out mine is not. <laughs> no, I don't know that word. <laughs> um, so it was an intense conversation, but in their 94 and 96 years respectively, our elders have learned a lot of English. And the English they said that we need to learn most importantly is the English that's contained in the stories that I write, both poetry and poetic narrative. I think I'm the only Canadian that thinks that that's okay in a novel. 
I'm all right with that. You know, it, it matches my language. And so that's part of, of the law around story. If you have something difficult to say, use beautiful language. My friend Duke knows that. And his son too. And so the double-headed serpent is a very violent story. I love it. It's just like I love cops and robbers and killing and whatnot, you know. <laughs> Wicked lady, but anyhow. <laughs> It's also a story about uh, what you call uh, bipolar disorder. We call it the split mind, the split mind. And a couple of things you need to know. We have very strong environmental laws in this island, on these lands. And it's not because somebody said, were you uh, a natural born uh, environmentalist, no. When I was naturally born, I t towered and shaved without any regard to where I was doing it, <laughs> like everybody else. But we went the wrong way at one point on this island. And that's how we learned all these laws. That's how we came to realize that we need to have a relationship with the land. I found out too that there's no word for sacred in my language, which I'm actually relieved <laughs> because I, I don't really like the word very much. <laughs> and it has a godly connotation and the Stalos don't have that God. And I apologize to the Anishinaabes. I know you all do have a creator, but we don't have that. And so I'm happy about that. We were always here. That's what the saying is. And this is how it works. We came from the spirit world, which actually is not the spirit world. It's two islands in space that are infinitely long, the, the old people say. They just go on and on forever. Well, the scientists are helping us out. They just found two beings in space that are tr three trillion light years long. And I said, I guess my ancestors have the right to call that pretty infinite. You know what I'm saying? Getting across that piece of land would be a, a trek. <laughs> anyway, they come here as children, actually elders. We call our children elders. You know, it, it, you, we say respect our elders, but we really mean the babies. Because they came as old people, from the spirit world. They know more than you do. And then they have to get their feet on the ground and it takes them about five years. So when we say respect our elders, that's actually a law. And it refers first to the children, then people with snow on the roof <laughs> because we're getting ready to leave. And we won't tell you anything more if you don't respect us. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyhow, <laughs> I'm not telling that snooty little boy that. <laughs> Give me a cup of water. Anyhow, our elders do take advantage of the goodness of the hearts of the young people. Um, I try not to too, too badly. Uh, but that is a law, respect your elders. And the word for children and elder is the same. So that's the first thing you need to know about Stalo. And if there's anything sacred, this old man said, it's choice. So when people came here, they had choices. And we would say to them, I wouldn't uproot the buffalo sage if I were you. Because that will warm up the prairie and create a furnace that will melt the ice in the polar region. We know we did that one time, a Sixika. I wouldn't do it. And they did it. And it did exactly what that Sixika old man said. 50 years later, the prairie is dry, suffers from drought, 
and the polar ice cap is melting. And you saw the storms here. The levels of the lakes are rising. Every little thing we do has a repercussion. That's the philosophy of caretaking the land. So the saying is, leave it the way you found it. We're long past that, aren't we? So we have violated every Anishinaabe law, every Salish law, every Cree law, every, every Haudenosaunee law that there is on this island. And that means we can't decolonize. Because decolonization is about whose law prevails. I'm on this Truth and Reconciliation Committee, you know. And I kept saying, when are we getting to the truth part? <laughs> but, you know, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> but I hope someday we do. But one of the things that I kept repeating over and over again is just that. And they said that they wanted to put a law course, when someone from the law department was talking to us, and they're gonna put a law course about indigenous law. And the students said, no, we want real law. And I said, yeah, I can see that. I can understand that. Because our law is said to you, and then you're given a choice. I, I met the trees in California, the big ones. And it said on the little plaque there, this tree will not die of natural causes. Isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to kill it. This tree has been through 378 forest fires and he's still growing. It can't die on its own. No disease I have will make it sick. Ooh, that's a relief. Because our cedars died of the same illnesses you brought with us, you know. But not the big redwoods. And I think to myself, when we die, we have to go and tell our stories to, if you're Christian, your maker. Or if you're indigenous, your relatives. And I would not like to tell the story of, well, I was a logger and murdered thousands of redwoods. And now California is insane over water because what do redwoods have? Long, complex root systems that hold the water in. So, you go into LA, it's all dry, and they're looking at BC, give us some water, <sighs> parched throats. That's a law. Take care of the water. Take care of the water. There's a garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean the size of Texas. This is my favorite thing, because you know I love jellyfish. I love jellyfish because they don't have a brain. but they can communicate, which white men have been telling me all my life, you can only communicate by speaking a language. <laughs> Kent Monkman proved that to be a bunch of crap. <laughs> he communicated all kinds of things in his art show. Every artist there ever was says that's not true. But of course, that's, that's what I've been told. And of course, it's not true for the jellyfish. They will take down a jumbo squid for no reason at all. I've witnessed that. People cut down the trees all over this continent for no reason at all. They pulled up the buffalo sage for no reason at all. Lawless people, people that don't understand this land has a direction has a destiny, has a right to be, 
and we're not paying attention to it. So then we're gonna go and have to tell our ancestors or our creator or the angels on high, whoever it is that we meet on the other side and say I was lawless or everyone else was lawless and I did nothing. So whose law should prevail on this continent? Well, the woman that wrote seasickness, nice white girl, very educated, did a lot of research, says this, there's been five mass extinction events on the earth. And uh, my people already know that, but I like hearing it from the page. I'm a modern girl. And we're heading for another one. Two more degrees of heat in the ocean and we'll have a mass extinction event. Now some people say we're endangering the earth. No, we're not. The land will be fine. There's all kinds of evidence out there that uh, we are the good for nothing animals. We don't contribute anything to the environment by being here. In fact, we subtract from it. So if we all perish in a mass extinction event, all the animals will probably cheer. <laughs> all the bugs and the bees and whatnot will have a party. God damn, we're, we're gonna survive. That's what they'll say. And then we'll have to begin again. And someone will say, we have to take care of the earth. That's what went wrong the first time. And the second time, and the third time. You see what I, where I'm going with this? Whose law should prevail over the land? And I really ask you to consider what has happened here since your ancestors came. Not very long. Not very long. Hardly half a millennia. Toronto is not very old. Canada is 150 years, and I, I feel like, um, what's his name? Alex Janvier, the artist, the guy who painted synopsis before they took a picture of it. Huh? There's more than one way to see. And the Ojibwe women who beaded little medallions that look exactly like my, uh, vitamin C under a microscope before they took a picture of it. You see, we know something about this island. We know something about these plants. We know something about the law that needs to prevail for us to be here. I believe that the being here is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not a right. Someone said to me, well, if you didn't have a heart, would you get somebody else's heart? I said, no. I'm going out with what I came in. The only things I'm missing is stuff I didn't have any say over. That was a tonsil and an appendix. I was too young, or I would have said, leave it there. My friend has had lung cancer for 15 years. Didn't have a thing done to her. She still got it. She's still around. She's still working. Now, I don't know if she's blessed. I don't know if what they say, you live right and you'll survive. I don't know any of those things. But I don't think that we have that much of a right to be here that we should harvest organs. If you said that to us 50 years ago, even white people would have been appalled but no, we're harvesting everything. We're harvesting things that cannot be replaced. We're harvesting stones. We're harvesting oil. We're harvesting all kinds of uranium that is dangerous and cannot be replaced. You cannot put oil back in the ground. You know, I was working with some people out in uh, New Chalmus. I love those people. They're the I always say they're the ones that posed for the polls, but anyway, that's another story. These guys were gonna uh, mine the gold in their territory. 
And they said to me, what does economic development mean? I said, well, economy is the exchange of money and things like that. Um, and development means to grow. So the old people said, well, you can't grow gold. So what are we actually doing here? I said, well, they'd be extracting it, then selling it. So it'd be extraction and commodification of gold. Oh, okay. Put that in the agreement then and I'll, we'll go along with it. The government wouldn't do it. They did not want to call it extraction and commodification. And I suspect that they had misgivings about doing that to the earth. I just suspect that. I suspect that they didn't want to die saying they did that. It sounds better when you say economic development, doesn't it? It's like cutting down virgin trees, you know? It's a virgin forest. And I remember being in school and going home and saying, Mom, you gotta find me a smarter school. So what for? Well, these people have no idea how trees have children. They called all those trees women and virgins. <laughs> and she says, oh, that, that's just a little piece of fiction they want you to swallow, just write it down in the test answer. And I found out that there's a lot of that kind of fiction going on on this land. And I want you to think about that when you study law. The thing that I love about law, though, your law, not mine, <laughs> is that it's about arguing. And that's something, you know, to watch two lawyers going at it like pair cobras. It really is something. <laughs> and and those, no, no swings. Like, you know, if somebody said some of those things to me, I'd be swinging. <laughs> I go, who the hell do you think you are? You know, <laughs> but no swinging going on. It's all civilized, and I guess that's why they call themselves civilized. <laughs> you know, because they can argue for days and months and years, and someone else makes the decision. The two characters doing the arguing don't get to settle it. That must be frustrating. I settle all the arguments I have. <laughs> you know, I'm not letting someone else say, she wins. No, <laughs> that's not the way it's gonna go for me. <laughs> and then I realized that that's how this society actually functions. We're never the judge. That's the thing about indigenous people, we're never the judge. We can argue with someone who controls whatever, but we can't be the judge. Someone else is always the judge. And so a group of young people and myself were talking about that in relation to the land. How are we gonna protect our land if we're never the judge? We're never the person that says, this is the law. Stop violating the law. The best we can do is pick up a picket sign and march around. And we saw what they did to the people at Standing Rock for that. Or at the parliament in the 70s, those kids that got beaten up there, or 1990 during the Oka crisis, we know what happens when we protest. But still we do. And there's another law that I, I find amusing in your world. You came here and we had transgender people, we had two-spirited people, we had homosexuals, we had women who were loose, women who were not, so on and so forth. And this was all considered filthy and dirty. That's why they called us filthy and dirty. And we washed every day without clothes. This is why we were considered immoral. Yeah. The doctors didn't wash when they pulled babies out of their women and a lot of them died. But our healers washed. They washed themselves, they washed their patients, and a lot of Aboriginal women served as midwives to white women. But when they started arresting us, who stepped forward? Nobody. Not a single person. 
step forward and said, what a crazy law that is, that indigenous women aren't allowed to deliver babies. Nobody stepped forward. And so women continued to perish from childbirth and probably until the 1920s when washing became standard. And it's still a difficulty to get people to wash in hospitals because what's the worst thing that can happen to you in the hospital? You can die of an infection still because somebody didn't clean their hands. It's still difficult to get non-native people to wash their hands. Now, what has this got to do with the land? Well, it's got to do with clean up after yourself. They covered 27 rivers in this city, shoved them all into a culvert. They were full of feces, dead babies, whatnot, disease things. And everybody was dying of cholera. And I can't remember the name of the other one, but it goes with typhus. Yeah, it goes with cholera. They go together, a couple, you know. And they put them in this uh, 50 foot round culvert and sent it out into the lake. The fisheries died. So when the Miss Mississaugas were told to leave, they were kind of relieved, I'm sure, because there was no fish left. <laughs> and they left. And now you have a situation where we get floods, don't we? And guess what? The flood curve is the exact shape of the rivers that are covered. And finally, the scientists admitted that water does have a memory and it goes back to the same path it's always been on. And I have to say that we're like that water, indigenous people. We have a saying back home that we are going to continue to be who we always were and always will want to be. Yeah. You go back, thank you very much. Oh, I love you. <laughs> if you go back and look at the oratory, it's the same oratory that you're getting right now. We're not changing our minds about this. Them young girls at Standing Rock says, don't they know we will not stop? And we will not stop until this land gets treated the way it's supposed to be, because look at the size of this island and its effect on the poles. The ice is melting and we don't have much time. And there's one way to solve it. The earth knows how to solve it. Okay, let's get the glaciers going again. And 260 million people will freeze to death. That'll be us, all of us. That's what's gonna happen. But keep your real law. If you really think this isn't gonna happen, keep your real law. And I pray for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. The land demands this. She's kicked up more storms in the last 20 years than all of previous recorded weather history. Thousands and thousands of people have perished because of it. We had this experience before. We know what happens. And we don't stand a chance because even as we are good for nothing, we are also fragile. We depend on this land. You do too. You might drive a car and have it covered over with cement, and you might have a nice house with central heating, but you depend on this land. And you will find out what real law looks like when the earth makes a decision about what to do 
with the damage that we have incurred. I thank you very much. I don't know how long more I have. I have 15 minutes. Does anybody want to entertain a question or two? No. You got lots of questions? Oh. That's absolutely true. And even uh, as, you know, science is split in two directions now, I, I don't know if you know this, but I like the direction of some of the scientists who are looking at the science of what's called holy knowledge. And this started in the 70s when um, they did, National Geographic's did a issue on what happens to uh, indig no some knowledge when indigenous people are killed. And they talked about the loss of indigenous knowledge as a result of killing Brazilian, bombing them really, Brazilian indigenous people. And uh, so a group of scientists decided to have a look at uh, the science of holy knowledge. And they started off with just, um, I should, they're not Anishinaabe, Dine Navajo scientists. And they got together a bunch of uh, indigenous people that were healers and a bunch of uh, philosophers that were indigenous. And then they got together indigenous scientists and they called it the conference, the science, conference of the science of holy knowledge. And I was invited and I said, why am I here? I'm not a scientist, I'm not a healer, I'm, you know, I think about things. And they said, that's why. You're a thinker. <laughs> we want somebody who would think about these things. I said, okay. So I participated in this, and more and more is being discovered that is validating and verifying all the teachings that we have around the land. But the scientists that are going in the other direction are the ones who get the money to do the research. So the research on the science of holy knowledge is going very slow, but it is going. And then there'll be a big, uh, debate over that one day about, about law, about land, and about science. And I hear people say, well, we have to fit indigenous science into our world, and actually that's not the way it's gonna go. You actually fit into ours. And I'll just tell you this one last little story we have these Dungeness crabs in Vancouver. They're fat little dudes, not the big snow crabs you get in the store. They're fat little crabs. They got claws that have a bite, I tell you. Take your baby finger right off. Anyway, they live at the bottom of the ocean with uh, the octopus and the giant squid. I don't know why they choose to live with those guys, but nonetheless, there you go. Um, one day they got, got up and they were crawling on the ocean, uh, the, the shore. And my friend phones me up and says, Dun the Dungeness crabs are walking along on the beach. And I said, they shouldn't be walking on the beach. I'm gonna go talk to Florine. Now Florine's 96 years old. She knows something about something. And she says, oh, in that little accent of hers, I the only thing I know about the crabs is when the flood happened and the volcanoes went off, the crabs came up on the land. And I said, red tide. She said, yeah. I said, toxicity. She said, I think so. So I said to my friend, I said, get your white guy friend there, the scientist, because he needs to test this water. 
So he comes and he tests the water. And there was 90 times the cadmium that is safe. Now, I happen to think that no cadmium is safe, but there's me, you know. <laughs> anyway, 90 times the cadmium levels that was safe. So the crabs were coming up to tell us that. Or else they were just trying to get away from the cadmium, one of the two. <laughs> but nonetheless, there they are. So he tests it, he takes it back, he comes back with his results. So we go ask Florine to say, Florine, what do we do about the cadmium? And she says, plant eelgrass. That's what they did before. We said, OK. And the white guy says, well, we got to study this. <laughs> and we said, no, you got to study it. We got to plant eelgrass. <laughs> and the water levels went back to normal. Eelgrass detoxified the waters. Plus, the whales came back, the sea lions came back, the seals came back, and those big springs that we love so much that are big as a bathtub came back. And we can actually eat them because they're not toxic. So we know how to take care of this problem. But we can't have someone going further upstream and dumping something else in the water. We cannot keep cleaning up after you. So clean body, clean mind, clean heart. Clean up the land and the waters that you use. That's our law. And that's our relationship to the land. And we will not stop until this country pays attention to that. You can't just dig up tar sands. There has already been huge repercussions from the Williston Lake Dam that dried up that delta for 750 miles long and 500 miles wide, killed millions and millions of ducks and geese and all kinds of other animals. That's before tar sands. Now they got that tar sands and it's going further. The whole north will be ruined. That whole north will be ruined. We've almost wiped out the caribou there. We've almost wiped out the whale population. We've wiped out almost the buffalo population. How much has to die for us? a view. Uh, think about that. I take my kids when they were small to visit the buffaloes on the prairies and uh, where, near where the Pegans are. And they said, Mom, their eyes look like they're people and that they understand us. And I said, they are. They're the relations of the Lakota people. You always remember that. So it wasn't just the Lakota weren't just fighting for themselves. They were fighting for their relatives, the buffalo. Yeah. And they're starting to make a comeback. We can repair the damage if we have time. But otherwise, we will suffer. And the earth will repair it. Yeah. Or as my brother says about the Kelowna fires, you know, you make your mother mad, she will give you a good spanking. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, without a frame. <laughs>
We lose the ability to automatically collaborate when we have a brain. And we have to remember that. And you know, one of the things the Stalos do when they stand up in a place like this to try and make a decision, remember, the point here is not to be smart or to show us what you know. The point here is to solve this problem and build a solution. So do not object to somebody's idea because you don't like them. Do not object to somebody's idea because they're ugly. Do not, you know, and they go on like this for half an hour about always agreeing with the people who have a proposed solution and if it doesn't work, we can try somebody else's idea. But we have to try something. I have to tell you more about those jellyfish. I would worry everybody because they're coming up the rivers and they're killing humans now. And they have no reason to kill us except maybe that's their patch where all the garbage is. I don't know. But they're mad about something. So we may have to go back to that. There's something primal about that, about automatically clicking into each other. I saw it in Kent Monkman's painting when, he, when he's sitting there, the, the white guys are there and they're all just kind of wandering off in their own minds. And the two uh, native guys, Crowfoot, I think, a pound maker, or two guys anyway, and they're looking at each other and I swear I can tell what they're saying. And their lips aren't moving. They are communicating. And I want to write down what they're saying to each other. Who do the guys think they are anyway? I don't know, but I'm not buying what they're selling. <laughs> you see, they're having this conversation. And they're in total agreement and total collaboration, just like those jellyfish. And I thought, Oh, this is so powerful. They're like jellyfish. They're back to their primal selves. So you have to go back before your ego was there. Around two. Yeah? But don't forget what you know. When a little two-year-old sees another little two-year-old, oh, my little granddaughter was so funny. She'd see a little boy, you know, so we knew she liked, gonna like boys when she got older. <laughs> She'd go like that. And then the little boy would get terrified. Oh, here's this little Indian girl coming at me. <laughs> and my little blonde curls are getting scared. <laughs> but eventually they'd start communicating with one another and she would do what he wanted to do because she knew she was the aggressor. <laughs> That's the great Indian way. <laughs> if you're the aggressor, cooperate. <laughs> so there's an idea. Do it different. Really seriously do it different. My brother is a smart guy, eh? He likes attention. I said, why are you so quiet, Roger? He says, because I like attention. <laughs> I said, nobody pays attention to a quiet person. They do when he finally speaks. <laughs> <laughs> nobody forgets that guy. <laughs> do it different. Yeah, let the others waste all their time talking and ferret out the best idea. It doesn't have to be yours. It just has to work. Like fluorine. Plant eelgrass. I have no idea what the hell eelgrass is gonna do, but it cannot hurt to plant it, right? Used to be there before, who knows? Well, it worked. I was surprised. I have to tell you, I had doubts too, like the white guy. Let's study this first. You know, he wanted to study it first. No, we got told to plant eelgrass. grass. We're going to do that. Do it different. Let's admit we know nothing. I mean, even I admit that. We let this land go. I'm doing a novel about uh, my father's landscape, looking for my father's landscape. 
I Can't Find My Father's Landscape, and it's based on Gianna Petrarca's amazing poem. She's an Italian poet. I'm looking for my father's landscape, the great columns, the white buildings, the, you know, whatever is in Italy. She's describing Italy. But I'm looking for the trees. I'm looking for the rivers. I'm walking around looking for the mountains they blew up to build Whistler. 27 mountains got completely blown up for a road to Whistler. I can never forget that. I remember that first road and how windy it was. And you couldn't go more, you could run faster. You know what I'm saying? 20 miles an hour, there you are. The guys were running faster <laughs> to that place. But now it's straight, see the sky highway, they're so proud of themselves. And those mountains are gone. They're in house sound. I don't know whose life they're disturbing there, but that's the deep, deepest sound in the world. Some white guy took a stick and put it down there, I guess, and measured it. All the other sounds too, but who knows. And the life that it's wiped out. I know that all the veg vegetation on the West Coast that I ate growing up, you guys eat asparagus, right? You know that's a sea vegetable, right? It came out of the ocean, somebody planted it in the ground, and then they destroyed the ocean garden. And it doesn't even take dirt to grow those things. They grow in gravel. Thousands of different plants that are destroyed. And then we go hungry. The fishes grow, have no habitat then. There's no place to get out of the sun. The little sea slugs, I love those guys too. The sea slugs can't transform. They're the ones that they're start off as all girls, right? An all girls club. And then they realize, oh, we have to have babies. So six of them transform into little boys. And in the process of transforming, they'll sometimes make themselves pregnant. It lends a whole new meaning to go fuck yourself, right? <laughs> oh, look at those sea slugs. And then they do all the women. <laughs> and back to being girls again. <laughs> what a life. <laughs> but now they have to hide somewhere else because the, the plant vegetation is gone. And of course, the sea slug population is dwindling. And. Uh, we love those little guys. I don't know what good they are for the earth or the oceans. They're food for a lot of creatures in the oceans, but they're also teachers for us. Yeah? They're teachers for us. Those little sea slugs, they know how to li live with gender whatever, bending, you know, <laughs> because they are amazing little gender benders. <laughs> and, you know, people used to tell me, well, you know, that lesbianism and all that's not natural. Well, of course it is. Well, animals don't do it. Oh, yeah, they do. In fact, six Indians demonstrated against the Canadian government for murdering 2,000 homosexual ducks. I was one of them. And they didn't even let the homeless eat them. They just wasted them. That's a crime. We make it a crime to be homeless. We don't allow them to get a duck out of the water. And then we shoot ducks for their gender or their sexuality. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy if you ask me. The land doesn't teach you to do that. The land doesn't say, go get those ducks, they don't have sex right. They don't like girls, the guys don't like girls. Someone was telling me one time they didn't like homosexuals because they have sex with men and I said, well, 
you don't have to worry then, do you? You're a girl. <laughs> they won't be bothering you. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much. So grateful. We have a little gift for Lee. Josh, do you want to grab it? Unfortunately, we couldn't get any eelgrass, but we did buy you a plant that is from this land. So this fern is uh, native to what we now call Ontario, but uh, we're just so grateful for your teachings. And I mean, with Lee and Jay, you get to learn and you get some stand-up comedy. So <laughs> it's a really <laughs> lovely combination. But I'm grateful to everyone. Um, Jay's paintings are for sales, not this one. No one can have this one, it's ours. <laughs> uh, but there are some prints that are for sale and uh, he has some business cards. So uh, please support our wonderful new friend. We're so grateful that he's here and so grateful to Lee for sharing that with us. Uh, she says it with a smile, but uh, it's pretty serious stuff and uh, it, it's neat because Lee didn't hear Zach talk but you know Zach said everyone's got a choice and this law school is here on this land and we um, you know I have to take better care of it myself and that's a choice I'm gonna make coming out of this session today and uh, and I hope that you all do too. So thank you so much for coming and uh, acknowledge, uh, I haven't had a chance to meet Jay's father yet, but Duke Redbird is here with us and he's, he's a pretty big deal. So we're very grateful that he joined us today. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, there's, I think there's probably still some food on the way out too, so please help yourselves and we'll see you all soon. Good question.